Councillor McLeod and Councillor Yankoff, thank oh. you for joining us. And I don't know if there's anyone online, but I'm sure hopefully there's a few more that are here. So I'll call the meeting to order. Is there any declarations of conflict of interest? No. Can I get an approval of our agenda? Sure. Second, okay. Sure. Approval of our minutes from October 20th and November 18th. Sure. Jason's good. Any business arising for those yeah, minutes? I just got something there, Councillor uh, McKay. Just trying to keep this on that front burner where we're going with the economic development officer's position. Should we have something in the new year, hopefully? Can we bring it, bring it up in the new year? I would assume that would come under the HR part, but... Yeah, but that's um, crisscrosses or... Yeah? Remember working inside of the silos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. okay, well, I'm sure Thank we'll you. have an update at that point at some that. point. Thank Put you. it in the minutes. We got it in the minutes. Yeah, Great. So we're going to move right into uh, our discussions and reports in the open. And the first thing we have is a what is public art presentation. And welcome to you ladies. Um, Laura will introduce you in a moment, but just to kind of refresh us, we... Uh, we're, we had the opportunity to meet with these ladies and discuss what the what they wanted to get a sense of what we knew or what we were looking for with this public art uh, in our city. And one of the things that came out of that is we probably need a little bit more information around what is public art. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Laurel, and thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as the Chair has mentioned, we have joining us today um, Donahan with the Planning Partnership and Jane Perdue. Jane uh, is the previous Public Art Coordinator with the City of Toronto, so she's consulting on the project as well. Um, as councillors in the room will recall, the City has engaged the Planning Partnership to develop a new public art plan for the City Corporation. Um, so it has already been mentioned. Um, over the course of the last few months, there's been a lot of one-on-one -on -one stakeholder engagement trying to establish a, a baseline for art that we do have in the city, how people feel about that art, what they'd like to see on a go-forward basis, and then trying to filter it all down to some themes and, and a direction of where we can go with a plan. Um, so out of those conversations, there is a desire for a presentation on what is public art and how can we shift our mindset to um, think about public art uh, outside of the boundaries of statues and, and murals and things like that. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Donna and to Jane. Um, and there is, you all do have a copy of the presentation in front of you, just in case it's difficult to see on the screen. So Donna, Jane, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. Can I share my screen? You should be able to, yes. Okay, I will do that right now. And are you seeing... Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Green Laurel. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much for um, making time for this presentation. We have about 20 minutes, and we're going to go ahead and go through um, just exactly what, what how it was introduced. What is public art? Um, Jay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just toss it over to you on my way in along the way. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you as well. Um, for helping us and, and um, uh, welcoming us to this presentation. I hope we can answer what is public art. We have some interpretations of it. We just wanted to show you a range of what it could be. So perhaps if we look at a definition, and uh, all cities and municipalities have different definitions, but this is um, something that's very practical and, and a way to look at public art, and that is it could be a work of art, it could be temporary or, or permanent. But the key is that it's accessible to the public. It could be privately developed or publicly developed, but it's accessible to everyone um, to be able to see the work. It also should have um, a, a quality to it. It's a, an ambitious ambition to have high quality art, and it also could be uh, could have a function. It could be a commemoration, uh, like a memorial. It could be freestanding, or it could be integrated into the site. And we have some examples of those. Um, also, public art should be commissioned um, or acquired or donated, uh, that, that is being given to the city in a very open and transparent process so that everyone understands how the art uh, was placed and how the city uh, acquires this uh, work of art. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, for, for this group, the Economic Development Committee, uh, you will look here for the role of public art in place making. I mean, it does contribute to the quality of the public realm. It improves the public realm in many ways. It creates a sense of identity, as you can see, it fills a civic pride. It, it speaks to uh, uh, what the city means and what the city wants to grow in their civic uh, squares and areas. 
and it also contributes to it generates cultural and social and economic value. Um, Donna and I put together these examples, and there's many examples that can show have a um, direct benefit of culture, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, particularly in Charlottetown, with the tourism that comes to the city, and, and how much uh, culture can generate, what kind of funds and interest in, in its city. Um, we have facts there, the Toronto Arts facts, about how four times more tourists come to the Toronto because of culture rather than sports. <laughs> um, if you have an overnight event or you have a big event, something like your art or the open event, um, that will attract a lot of tourists and a lot of interest as well. And so that generates funding. funding. Um, over on the top right, uh, speaking to and addressing how the Canadian heritage and multiculturalism announced over $8 million in support for Federation Centre and festivals in Prince Edward Island. Um, and how arts and culture are really essential to for the inclusiveness of your of the society and at the heart of Canada's growing economic and creative economy. Um, and then um, there's another report. Again, there are many, but another one where arts and economic prosperity report completed by the Americans for the Arts, which is um, that funds the National Endowment of the Arts. It's a very major program <laughs> in Europe. And they've had studies and uh, talking and showing about how the communities that invest in art and how they can reach for jobs, uh, promote um, the economy, the growth, and of course the, the quality of the life in the city. Um, and the arts and culture tours, they will spend more time. If your city is interesting, and I know your city is, but they'll spend more time there. And art and culture and public art is very much a part of that. Um, now, the, the, what is public art? So there, there are basically there are three kinds. Um, trying to fit them into these different boxes it doesn't always quite work, but there's three kinds. One is independent, and this is a work of art that is freestanding. It's been created um, away from the site, but it can be, um, it can work in that particular area and site, but it could probably also work in another location that has the same scale or context of the site, and we'll, we'll show some examples. Um, Site-specific. Uh, you run competitions where uh, an artist is asked to address the site, so it's specifically about that area, so that the artist would respond to the immediate context of the site. It could be for its meaning, function, relevance. Uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't work somewhere else. It might be telling a story. It might be a narrative about what actually happened, some, something historical or something more contemporary. What happened on that site, and then integrated art is a work of art that is actually a physical part of a building or a structure or a landscape. So that if the building were demolished, then the art would be demolished as well. It would be very difficult to remove it or relocate it, almost impossible. And then there's all of these different kinds of art. I mean, it could be commemorative, a memorial. It could work as a destination or a gateway. It could be functional, as we said, I said earlier. It could be temporary, or it could have something to do with the environment and telling uh, educating people about the environment. So, um, the next slide. Um, this is a map that we put together that showed um, a number of uh, locations in the city of Charlottetown. It shows where public art can be located, and there's, uh, there's a possibility of parks, open spaces. It could be anywhere, frankly. It could be on your trails, it could be on your sidewalks, streets, it could be a gateway, it could be maybe an unused vacant space, it could be a facade. Uh, the side of the building, could be in the public buildings, bridges, retaining walls, or in a private building, maybe the structure or part of the infrastructure of, of that particular building. So what we're going to walk through now is, uh, Jane's going to walk through a number of examples from places all over the world that show public art located in these types of spaces that are in, in urban centers. Yeah, so here's the one where I said about independence. So these works of art are really quite fabulous. You can see the scale of them. You can see that I think that they work very well. Some you, you might know the one that's in Chicago by Alexander Calder. That was placed there. That wasn't designed specifically for that project, but you can see with the scale that it works in that area. The um, the uh, the spirit capture by Ron Barry, that's in Barrie, Ontario, north of uh, Toronto. And again, that's really quite a marvelous work of art, but it could actually work in another location. 
Or could the one that's called Approaching Red, which is by a private developer in downtown Toronto. It's a magnificent color, <laughs> red obviously being part of the, uh, the, the title, but it's wonderful sculpture, but it could work somewhere else as well. Again, if you had that kind of space and it, it has the volume that it would be able to accomplish. Next slide. Um, here's more independent ones. You may know the work by um, uh, William McElfrey, the businessman. I've seen these businessmen at a lot of different places, <laughs> and they're delightful. I've seen them on streets, and here it's called The Encounter in Toronto, but they could work anywhere. They're very familiar and they're fun. The Anish Kapoor, which is the mountain, which is to the top right, um, again, that was commissioned for that site, but frankly, uh, a sculpture of that scale could work somewhere else as well. As, were, as is the sculpture by uh, Louise Bourgeois, which is in the lower right-hand corner. This is a, an addition of, I think there's eight of them. There's one in Bilbao in Spain, and I don't know what the others are, but this is the National Gallery. So this is a, a spire, a very large spire, as you can imagine walking underneath it. But again, it's independent. It works because of the context and the scale of the site. Uh, there's another independent. This one caused uh, quite a bit of angst many, many years ago. It's by Henry Moore, very familiar, uh, wonderful sculptor uh, from uh, Britain. And the archer uh, is in front of City Hall, and it was controversial at the time. This was in the late 60s, and now I can't imagine City Hall without the sculpture. But it wasn't created for the front of City Hall. It was created, uh, it, was, it would have been overseas in Britain, and it was, uh, I guess it was fabricated, and another version of the archer was brought to the city hall in the urban square. And uh, more independent, this one's one of my favorites, and I've never been, I've never seen it, but this teddy bear, I mean, who doesn't love a teddy bear? This is in San Diego. Um, it's at the university. It's part of a collection, the Stewart collection. He's just a lovely, so sweet, just <laughs> rather large. A uh, hard cuddle with the teddy bear, but he could work somewhere else as well. Or here, there's a temporary installation that's uh, in Brooklyn. I think, Donna, you may have taken this photograph, I'm not sure, in, uh, at New York's waterfront. So again, uh, an independent artwork, it works along the waterfront, and so that's the context in which it's been successful. But here's some site specifics. And if anyone has been to Chicago, to Millennium Park, you've been able to see the Thousand Faces and the Chicago, the Thousand Faces, the water feature, which is over on the left, those three images. Now that's site specific because the artist uh, took images of people in Chicago and it was designed specifically as a water feature. It's very playful, lots of fun. People wait to see not only the image, but they wait to see the water spurting out of the mouth, so it's playful in that way, and, um, and it's very engaging. You would uh, perhaps know the watermark. Um, I think this is in, uh, this is in Hexpat, or Frederick, I think Frederick to the place. But you know the artist, which is, who is uh, Gerald um, uh, Balu, I think you pronounce this. Uh, we, we got to speak with Gerald um, a few weeks ago. He's a very talented local artist. But that's specifically about marking the water and the edge of the water. And then the one in the lower right, <laughs> I like this one. Um, this is about the garment district in Toronto. So it's this huge uh, you know, symbol, basically, and telling you the story of this is why it works. It works because it tells you the story of this used to be the garment district in downtown Toronto. And next one. Here's another one. I think I've got favorites for big teddy bears. Um, you can see it's in Colorado. It's a convention center. It was. Um, uh, commissioned specifically for the center, and look at this. It says, this is a big teddy bear looking in, <laughs> or bear, looking in the window saying, oh, I see what you mean. So that would only work there. Maybe he could be peering in another window as well, but this was specifically that for that site, designed and uh, celebrated. And then in uh, Lethbridge here, this is also site specific by um, Elan Sandler. He's an East Coast artist. And this is about, the, it was a competition um, about the anniversary, the 100th year anniversary of trains that were traveling across the bridge, which you can see in the background. So this is part of one of the, one of the wheels off of the train. So that's very specific and tells the story about some of the history in that bridge. Down at the waterfront in downtown Toronto, again site specific by um, uh, Jennifer Marmon and Daniel Bourne. The Water Guardians, again another very playful. There's a water feature here. They're guarding us against the waterfront. 
but it was designed specifically and you can walk underneath it and again that scale works very well designed specifically commissioned specifically for the west online or another site specific here in um one is in uh well they're both in vancouver to see how it's used with the grenville island underneath the bridge the blanketing of the city very beautiful acknowledgement to first nations and then another by Th thunderbird by judy Bloomfield, also in vancouver very uh site specific and about the history there and then um uh, this is an entryway to uh the cineplex in a movie theater and a gateway by john McEwen. so the scale of it di designed specifically so that the cars can drive through you know that you've arrived it's almost like a gateway to their complex um, and another, I think this is uh, unfortunately it's very apropos these days, waiting for climate change. This is in France, you see? Uh, those are, um, uh, well, you can see they're waiting to see what's going to happen with the climate change. So while it's funny, it's also very serious and trying to uh, make the point about it's almost too late to be waiting for climate change because it's already there and it's surrounded these, these individuals. Or I think this is also a photo that Donna might have taken. Mm -hmm. This is um, Tom Otterness, um, a well-known American sculptor, and it's called The Marriage of Money and Real Estate, and it's specifically in the waterfront, uh, the East River. In <coughs> the and then look at this one. This is so lovely, it's called a Red Ribbon, just working its way through um, through this area in China. So you can see how specific that was. It's, a, it's basically, I guess it's a boardwalk, it's a walkway leading people through that open space. Very beautiful, and um, you can see how beautiful it is. Here's, an in, here's integrated. So when we talk about that art is actually part of the, the infrastructure. Um, on the lower left, um, this is a uh, underpass park. It's actually underneath uh, an expressway making that open space something that's animated and interesting and the art is the art that's on the, on the surface of the building uh it's on the on the surface of the underpass and the art is the 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 the, the, the light and the the reflections coming down on the people underneath there and then here's another one that you would know in montague i think um uh, also donna supplied this this is lovely also by gerald I, I really like this one i think it's very nice so that's specifically about that i think it's an arts trail that, that you have in montague or the lower right it's it looks like a billboard it's not it's it's this wonderful uh view of color it's called uh garden garden or streams and basically what it is it's a screen behind this is a condominium and there's a swimming pool so it's up on i think it's the third or the fourth floor so it's like a, a visual um uh, block to the gardener that's underneath there so it serves to animate the area but also serves as functional in that way and next slide thank you this is um something a really marvelous uh, memorial that um was designed uh, by a uh, planning partnership and collaboration with uh, an artist and uh, a, a novelist uh jane um uh jane Urquhart. So it, here it's integrated. This is a veterans memorial integrated into the walls. You can see it only works in this context in the sense that it, it's a very much a part of the memorial and um, one that actually works very effectively outside of Ontario legislative service. Or here, this is integrated. This is Storm King, which is in uh, New York State. This is by Andy Goldsworthy. Um, you see it? It's this. It's integrating into the landscape. It's this, yeah, beautiful, beautiful area, and uh, designed by this British artist um, and integrated into the. It, it almost disappears. We put this one in as well. Integrated. This is in Vancouver at the Granville Arts. Very popular. And one of the reasons we've included this is because many people spoke to us about, I think it's called the, is it the urban tank? Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't that be fabulous if you could paint those tanks? <laughs> I mean, they're very much a part of your infrastructure. They're necessary, but why not make them more interesting as they did with these, with these tanks? Here's another example of integration. This is also back in San Diego. Look at the pathway. It's a snake. So there, that's another, it's integrated with the, it's functional, it's a landscape, it's animated, and it's really quite marvelous. If you look at the, at the bottom right, you can see there's people there, <laughs> so big, that's right. And then another example, um, another beautiful um, integration, as it, uh, an artist working for a landscape architect, between these two towers is this beautiful garden, um, 
of uh, granite seating area. It's just really animating the area, making it a beautiful public space for anyone to enjoy. Just keeping my eye on the time yes. a little bit. Yeah, uh, where it's 320, so. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, very quickly, okay, temporary works. You can see seating arrangements on, on uh, Main Street or walkways, painted, uh, helping people come to the sidewalks with, with colors. Or here, um, there's one that's from Charlottetown here, but bike. Uh, that's integrated, it's functional. Um, or a seating arrangement, the orange one. Um, again, integrated into and in design of the, the bike rack. Or another, on the left hand side, these are wraps of the quilts that wrap the trees. That was a competition and they animate and make that area very beautiful. Or painting, again, they could be temporary, but tree wraps and then the pavement on the sidewalk for the indigenous community. This is one that's in Boston, uh, an American artist who works in fiber, but you can see a temporary installation integrated and stretching across the fiber with the light between the buildings. Or another integration, temporary in, in a in a forest in, in France, also for a for artists. And imagine coming across something like that when you're walking through a trail or or a forest and seeing art there. Um, and uh, I think we just we just okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one. That's, that's the one also in Charlottetown. So this is integrated. It's um, I think there was a series of artists, but it also includes Doug Dumay, <laughs> who's uh, one of your staff and a practicing artist. And this is about the shoreline. So this is really interesting because oh talking about and making people aware of the environment and the very necessary uh, protection of the, of the shoreline in Charlottetown. Mm -hmm. The next one. This one is in, uh, J uh, just back one, sorry. I it's it's okay, it is in Germany, and it looks like a bridge, and it is, but there was an artist who was commissioned to do a sound work, and it was an opera. So you could deal with sound as well. So the opera, imagine sounds that you could hear echoing off the, uh, the bottom of the infrastructure of the bridge, specific to that, that area of Germany. Beautiful. Or lighting up uh, a bridge. Lighting up a bridge that was actually designed by an artist this is a temporary light installation at an event called the Wee Blanche, which is similar to your art in the open event. Or here, uh, these are fun, um, in Chicago and in Montreal, uh, Christmas, celebration of a season uh, through light and color. So those are temporary installations as well. And I think maybe Jane will um, leave this for the benefit of um, people have hard copies of the past so the details are That's just fun. a couple of case studies about the impact of art and you can um, we're just happy to talk about those in questions and I wanted to just end the presentation with this slide that is this a bit of a timeline that takes um, as a reminder for everybody on the meeting that the city has a really solid foundation of arts and culture policy that takes back developed 15 years ago it was augmented with the public art policy that was developed in 2020 you have a fantastic art advisory board committed talented group of people and we're now um, in the process now of preparing the public art plan and one of the things that we're um, looking at through our exercise with our arts advisory board is the opportunities and the potential of having um, the oversight of the arts and advisory arts and advisory board oversight by a full-time public art or culture coordinator on staff um that the end of our presentation just trying to keep my eye a little bit on time mm -hmm. happy to answer any questions that people have well thank you very much that was really informative for sure I'm going to turn it over. Is there any questions from anybody? Councillor Yankov? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, just wondering if maybe you could speak a little bit about the economic and touristic alignment with the value of public art to a destination? Sure. I, and you know what was interesting for me when I was going through um, lots of background documents in Charlottetown and Art in the City and some of the other events that's been in, in, in the city, that this is not new to people in 
Charlottetown. I read quote after quote after quote of people that recognized the value of art and culture for economic development. These were a couple that we put together. Jay talked about Millennium Park in uh, Chicago. This is another art installation in that park. And it like uh, uh, off the spectrum when they tallied up the benefit of the installation on that waterfront. And here's just one this last bullet, the impact on the adjacent real estate market. It estimated to be $1.4 billion in 10 years a span. Um, the Moss Gardens, James, this is one that you're familiar with. Yes, um, this one shows how you can, um, if you've secured uh, money for uh, public art, but it's not enough, you could pool money to get some, it, when you have an objective in mind. And this was about improving an area uh, to the north of what's called Down to Park, where uh, uh, airplanes were fabricated and manufactured. So this is a celebration of the site, but it's also a very good example of pulling money together until there's enough funds there to, to create a, 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 a beautiful public space and, and improving the area. So, so you know, I mean, there's now there's homes in the area. This is part of the economic drive to, to uh, improve the quality of life, make it an area that isn't barren. It's not just about cars driving through, but it's about a place where you can sit, you can feel safe, and you can enjoy and look at some art as well. Thank you. Uh, for me personally, I, I find it interesting to talk about the oversight of a full-time public art or culture coordinator. Could you maybe give us a little bit of a rationale about why you feel that would be a full-time position? Sure. Um, one, it comes from a little bit of our experience doing other um, public art plans. I'm just going to stop um, sharing this for a second so everybody can see the video from feed. Um, coming from our experience doing public art plans for a whole host of other communities, and with Charlotte and I looked at the um, public art policy, and I looked at the responsibility you were giving to your volunteer art advisory board, and I thought that that is a lot, it, 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 it's an extraordinary level of responsibility to be given to a volunteer board without the oversight of a full-time um, public art coordinator. We, um, you know, called through some of the work we've done in other places, and we put together all of the responsibilities of a person without the responsibility of full-time public art culture coordinator. And it's a page and a half of things that can be um, done. And that person really helps set up the city for a, a a vibrant and a successful implementation of your public art program. Um, it, it builds on all the work that you've done already, but most importantly, it gives makes public art a priority. And with having a person in that position to be the liaison amongst the senior staff, fantastic senior staff that you have in all the departments that all frankly recognize the role and value of public art, but you need one person that's pulling all those interests together and keeping it top of mind for every public park that comes uh, up for reconstruction for every community facility, for the new sports center, for a new fire hall, for new roads, for new, just everything. You saw a list of where public art can can be accommodated. So it really needs somebody connecting all those dots on a daily basis and keeping it top of mind. Thank you very much. Is there any more questions for our presenters Donna, today? I sent you, uh, it's related to your uh, integrated into the design of temporary street side cafes or permanent crosswalks. I sent yep. you something from Miss Dixon with the 3D, from Miss Ms. Dixon, 3D crosswalks. Yes, yes, yes. And, yes, I, and I, I know our call was cut off because I think the fire alarm went off in your apartment building. Oh, right. <laughs> Yeah. And we never got reconnected. So did you do any look into that? Um, we have, I'm familiar with the, that graphic, Jane, you know, the graphic and the 3D crosswalks where it's mm -hmm. so that it, yeah, I mean, it's another <coughs> fantastic example. We'll make sure we include that in the um, examples of what public art can be. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great idea. And as for Gerard Beaulieu, uh, yes. Uh, he now works with the Confederation of the Arts as a 
preparator, or preparator, I think it is. Is that the term you use? Oh. And uh, he's got a beautiful piece. Uh, 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 I think it's a bronze piece of the two Canadian leaves um, adjacent to one of our uh, Shelletown event grounds. So he's got some beautiful art, and, and uh, it's definitely a person that we could look at again. I think he did that, those two leaves for the 2014 celebration, the 150th anniversary of the Shelletown Conference. So he's got great expertise, and he's local. Yeah. Well, he, he's, he's local and he's very talented, but I remember when I interviewed him, he also, if I may, said, you know, we have to think about how we can keep the arts in Charlottetown, um, how we can help to support the arts community. And my understanding is that many, um, a lot of people returned during COVID, but I also hear that it's very expensive, studios, fabrication, and so on. And it was Gerald who actually pointed out we need to have uh, be able to support the local arts community, and and he's very successful. I know yes. that he's mm -hmm. to nurture, to bring up other artists, to give them experience, and give them opportunities to celebrate our own, your own. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, ladies. That was really informative and great, and we do certainly appreciate you taking the time to present your report. Um, Laurel, did you want to say anything more? No, I think that um, we look forward to January 24th when you're going to unveil yeah. the full plan um, at a special meeting of council. And if anything comes up in the meantime from anyone in the room, then we'll certainly reach out. But other than that, the mayor would like to wish you Merry Christmas, Happy on Holidays, on behalf of the chair. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. 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 No, it's good. We're live. I gotta remind myself that we're live. You can't kill the mayor in live session. That's not nice. That's I'm quite aware. I just said I can't. You can't kill the mayor. <laughs> that wouldn't be very nice. Thank you, and Laurel. Thank you for organizing that. For someone like me, it provides an insight to what public art is. I mean, I kind of have my own vision of what it is, and I know how wrong I am in my vision now. So I'm looking forward to the full presentation. It's, it's an education for sure. Yeah, it's a different, a different area. Thank you. It's a shame we didn't do here what other provinces and, and other states that I've read about have done. Is that any time any organization gets any level of government funding to build something, like for example, like our library, a percentage of it has to, to be, be committed for to public art. I agree. Anything like so, you think about our fire stations, our ball fields, our parks, that's all opportunities for public arts, island artists to create public art in our, in our, in our buildings. And I think and we can still look at it. And hire local. And hire local. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And I think that needs to be pushed. So, good. All right, we're going to move on to number two. Thank you. You guys are welcome to stay for the economic development meeting, but I'm sure, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming along. All right, Wayne Long, the economic development report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a few uh, quick uh, highlights for the uh, committee at a higher level. Um, we recently submitted an application uh, to the CAN Export Community Investment Program. This is federal funding uh, which helps you um, line up one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings on the international stage. The specific focus for this upcoming uh, fiscal is on Germany. Obviously, time will uh, tell what happens internationally travel-wise, uh, but we have applied for that fund. We have over the years as well have already been uh, successful. So an application has been recently submitted to that. Um, we recently participated on, in an information platform session with um, Invest Canada uh, with the IRCC, which is the Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship uh, Canada organization, as well as Service Canada. We were providing an update on various programs and initiatives available uh, for entrepreneurs, immigrants, refugees and otherwise. Uh, we continue to work with uh, Innovation PEI. We're in a process now where we've been sharing um, inventory assets with respect to promotional pieces and destination appeal um, documents. And uh, we're at a time where we would look to update, obviously, some of ours locally, internally. 
and uh, align that with uh, the strategies of the uh, province of Prince Edward Island through Innovation PEI. Um, we hosted, which you attended, as well as a number of other people in this room, uh, the, uh, the, the Physicians Welcome Reception recently for 17 uh, new physicians. <coughs> Give another shout out as you did at council uh, recently to Charlotte Nicholson for her work on that particular um, evening, which went over very, very well. Um, we also have uh, re-engaged and new, renewed our membership with the Atlantic Provinces Economic Development Council. Um, we've been a member there and uh, continue to um, do so. And the last item is that we recently met, um, just yesterday in fact, with Immigration and Refugee Services Association with a PEI. URSA, which is the new PI Association uh, for Newcomers rebranded, regarding their current needs report that they established uh, during the pandemic. Um, it's finding some recommendations uh, for the years of 2021 to 2022 to talk about some of the um, needs and wants and interests of the newcomer uh, immigrant community. Uh, some of those included um, recreational needs, sporting needs, access to venues and facilities. We talked uh, about um, sustainability efforts and more uh, open dialogue and communication with respect to the community at large. One of the things the newcomers uh, are missing is our orientations, which are highly successful, which we would normally host here in the fall. And obviously COVID, COVID has impacted that the last couple of years. So early in the new year, we're working toward an online platform that will align with up to 50 participants coming on for various talking sessions and speakers. The mayor will have an opportunity to address. Parks and Recreation will be, we may bring in guest speakers. There's a lot of mental health issues and challenges, missing family in international countries, understanding their community better. So we're going to reconnect again in, um, in January and we look forward to uh, um, unveiling that kind of uh, communication link throughout the winter months. So let's quick update on economic development. Thank you, Wayne. So could I just ask Madam Chair, the, the paper that you have here, the uh, backgrounder, is this related to what newcomers is talking about? Best and brightest, Canada's number one of them. Or is that a separate issue? It's, it's part of the... No, it's a separate, it's a separate item. It's That's a, a, yeah, it's is that connected to what you talked about? Not really, Your Worship. It's, well, it's connected to, but the first, the second item I talked about, about us participating in Invest Canada um, yeah. Immigration Refugee Services. They shared a number of documents, but one of the ones was the value of um, yeah. of immigration. When we come up to that, all yeah, all it's just is. Wayne. You know, we got a big disconnect when it comes to providing services for our new immigrants. Like I, this past summer, I attended the uh, cricket competition over in Stratford. They had a cricket pitch, mm -hmm. you know, and I think Kevin and I have brought Councilor Rams and I discussed this in Parks and Recreation. You know, we have to look at other. Uh, sports fields other than you know, baseball fields and soccer fields we have to open up more to what's their needs are because cultures, yeah. the important thing about uh, immigrant, new immigrants coming to anywhere is building that community of interest and part of that community of interest is a place of worship and also a place of gathering and a place of gathering is a sports field or a community hall yeah. so we really have to work between the uh, the silos. Uh, Eugene Murphy, who was a former principal at Stone Park, uh, said that a Vietnamese, Vietnamese family that has lived here, I'd say 10 plus years, moved to Toronto. They moved to Mississauga because they just, there's just not, a, it, there's, there's, there's no connection here, there's nothing to hold them back or hold them here. So it's important. And the retention of new immigrants, I think we're at 16%. We're the lowest when it comes to retaining new immigrants. So we really have to look at it on all, you know, all cr across the, mm -hmm. all spectrums, parks and recreation, economic development, um, um, all the other uh, environment and sustainability, everything that we do in, in, as a city corporation. Yeah. No, it's, it's a good point, and this is, this is the report that I referenced. They did a report to determine from immigrants. So one of the key things, a couple of things, they praised the city of Charlottetown for their work uh, with things such as the newcomers welcome orientations, the, 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 the raising of flags your worship that you're doing, they highly praised that. They uh, praised the physician's uh, reception, um, the availability of staff to interact and direct people with respect to programs, et cetera. 
But one of the things they talked about is the challenge that you just talked about. One of the key things is the whole sport and social cultural integration. And so Parks and Recreation was a part of the meeting that we had yesterday. Christopher Drummond was here, um, Ramona was here on behalf of sustainability. Um, Lord, or, sorry, Charlotte was here um, as well. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about is trying to um, overlap and work better. But they did express from a sports perspective, a number of them, they like things like skating. They love skating. They, uh, they love uh, badminton, racket sports. But like you said, cricket is huge. They, they're looking for a cricket uh, facility within the, the boundary of the city of Charlottetown. They're looking for other access to um, venues outside of regular minor sport program, which as you know, our facilities are already to capacity. So I think the ongoing dialogue um, will help. Um, it's good that we're having ongoing communi communication, but I really believe, and this is just a personal opinion, I think that we need to have an economic development strategy that takes immigration into consideration. Yeah, and Madam Chair, both public skates that we had for Christmas, the first one at Simmons, 80% renewable immigrants. Absolutely. And then Cody Banks, half. Mm -hmm. uh, the flag raising, when we did for the Ukrainian uh, mm -hmm. Ukrainian uh, national holiday, there must have been 100 people in front of the city hall. Yeah. Like, they, that gives them a sense of being part of the community. It does. And they're just little, little gestures of, yes, you are welcome, but you know, we want you to be part of the community. So I think we have to really work on that. And I, I think you're, you've already started that process. Yeah. yeah. No, it's Thank very you. important. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. Have any questions? Jason, you're good? Good. Okay, Laurel, we're going to move into the Tourism and Culture Report. Okay, um, so since the last meeting, we've been offering um, quite a bit of support to Wayne and um, a number of his files, which I know he's going to update during the event manager, management report, so I won't touch on them. Um, we've also been really deep into holiday events, obviously it's the time of the year. So we finally successfully got the uh, neighborhood parade tours wrapped up after several weather-related challenges. Um, they were a huge success again this year. We are hopeful we'll be able to go back to a traditional parade format um, next year. Time will tell. Uh, Capital New Year activities were announced late last week. So there's a lot of great um, free activities taking place. There is a, a skate at Eastlink Center. There's a kids show at Trailside. There's family swims. There is mini putt happening um, down at the facility at Confederation Court Mall. There's activities happening at Confederation Center. I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but um, they're there. You can book online right now. And um, there's been a few adjustments made just after yesterday's announcement, but everything is proceeding. We've just extended some of the time periods in order to deal with um, a few reduced capacities. We've also um, been assisting Wayne with uh, some wintertide events. Um, we just finished judging the home decorating contest on Monday night. It was the best year that I can remember. There were so many entries, they were so well done. Yeah. So it's really a great time to be driving around the city and, mm -hmm. and looking at lights. There's been a lot of residents that have really put a lot of time and effort into um, those displays this year. While I'm on the topic of <coughs> civic events, um, our funding application for our annual Canada Day funding has been officially filed with the federal government. So we usually um, get the results of that around the beginning of their fiscal year. Um, I had the opportunity late last month to attend a two-day facilitated workshop um, on preparing our communities for cruise. So we're hopeful that the cruise industry will be returning to Charlottetown in the spring. Um, there was a lot of really great conversations that were had and it was actually really inspiring to know that we are ahead of, um, ahead of the game as to where we should be. It was kind of the ongoing theme that we were always several slides ahead in the presentation in our question asking. Mm -hmm. So the uh, facilitators felt confident that Charlottetown was in a good place and that the, um, the contributors to the cruise industry, whether it's through um, tours or services, um, we are thinking in the right direction for welcoming those, those passengers and crew back <coughs> in the spring. Um, November was a busy month for the Canadian Capital Cities organization. Um, we host our third installment of our new speaker series on the topic of the Capital City's role in remembrance, which is quite well received. Um, and we had our AGM, which the chair was able to attend and where I was elected as the president of the organization. So 
I uh, have now chaired two meetings. I took over the day after the AGM, um, so things are going well. It's going to be a big year, um, and our next meeting of the board is currently scheduled for February 3rd and 4th in Ottawa. Um, and then I think lastly for today, the uh, as we know, based on the previous presentation, the Arts Advisory Board is hard at work on wrapping up um, the new public art plan with the planning partnership. So that will be um, presented next month for endorsement. And then additionally, we've been working hard over the last few months with our own planning department on um, the application from Discover Charlottetown and the Old Triangle for the new Erica Rutherford artwork that um, council approved for installation at the Old Triangle on Monday night. I did just want to share, I know that there's been some uh, comments, we never should read the comments on media stories, but there's been some comments online about why that particular piece um, was selected and I know that while Erica Rutherford is is a very popular island artist, um, some people may not know the full story be behind that particular piece of artwork. So. The piece that was approved is entitled, We Can't All Be Perfect. Um, it was created in the mid-1970s, and if you look at it and you don't know the backstory, you say, well, all three girls that are depicted in that artwork look pretty perfect, it's, it, but it's, it's a play on words. Um, the artwork was actually developed while Erica was transitioning from male to female, and she was um, going through some issues with you know, gender dysphoria, dysphoria and how she was gonna fit into this feminine ideal of what was perfect at the time. Um, so if you look closely at the artwork, you'll see two of them are wearing black boots and one is wearing red. So that's kind of the play on what we can't all be perfect while also depicting um, the, the quote unquote perfect female at the time. So it's a little bit of a tongue, tongue in cheek nod, but there's a deeper story there about um, what it's like for the transgender community as they're going through that transition process. And as we know, um, she was a pioneer for that community locally. So there's a bit more of a story there. It is a really relevant piece of art and it's a celebration of the LGBTQ2 plus community. So I applaud council for proving that. I really look forward to uh, the installation of that particular piece. And with that, I'll hand it back to you. All right, thank you. Is there any questions for you? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Well, I'll get, uh, going back to the, the home decoration, Yeah. which was fantastic. Sharon and I went around when we got our cards. We could tell that you did based on oh, entries. There was plenty yeah. in your neighborhood. No, the reason we did it, and we noticed that that week, and I know they had to be in by December 4th, I think it was, right? By 4.30 or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But we noticed it wasn't a whole lot of people had their lights turned on. We were up that Thursday night and mm -hmm. Friday night of before the 4th, so we were then end of November. So we were just talking which we don't usually talk a whole lot in the car, but we were just chatting. And we just, if it was a week later maybe, or is it so time sensitive? Because it's the fourth is just an application it, deadline. Yeah, it's just the application deadline. So the judging typically takes place um, during this, the week that right. we're currently in. So people can apply without having their lights up because there's usually about a you know an eight to ten day gap between mm -hmm. when the registration cutoff would be versus when the judging actually takes place um i think that i know that the the cards that we asked counselors to go around to kind of approach houses that were well decorated um i did hear from a number of counselors and i can't take credit for that that was doug's idea no it's good um but we did hear from a number of counselors that they really enjoyed mm -hmm. that aspect of it and they would like to see that continued um so i know that it's difficult if homes aren't decorated for you to identify who should should enter um maybe we give you more cards and it's just kind yeah of no an education process it was just a week of Say then yeah, there's a bit of, of logistics that need to go into the following it. week all the way to run. Yeah, so I, I we guess could, it's all we could maybe look at pushing it ahead by a few days, like to cover that yeah. weekend off, um, and maybe have the, the application period end like the beginning of the following week. And maybe we were up too early or something like that, but we, we, we thought that they had to be in by that Monday. No, so it's, that it's, coming, it's just the, the applications due then, right? The oh. judging only happened this week. Exactly. It only exactly. happened two days ago. Yeah. yeah. He's, yeah. he's just commenting on it was hard for them to know which homes to approach with these cards right. to encourage to enter oh, because yeah, they yeah. didn't have their There's, lights turned on. Yet, I mean, so. but the following week, Wayne, everybody had their lights on. Yeah. So we can look at yeah, okay. we can look at the dates next year and see yeah. if there's a if there's a few days that we can adjust yeah. that maybe no, we no. include that. No, we just thought we'd throw it up there for people going around driving and just saying. Sure. Okay. 
But we were bonding that night, eh? <laughs> Thank you. Coffee. All right, we're going to go into D, event management report. Wayne? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to, uh, Actually, I have the next three. A few, uh, I'll just scroll through then. A yeah. few quick uh, highlights. Um, recently attended the Prime Time Sport Entertainment Congress in Toronto, uh, which where we some concluded some, um, some good business there. Uh, the Tourism Industry Association of Canada, National Tourism Congress, and Sport Tourism Mission in Ottawa. Uh, recently, which also was highly um, successful. The Charlottetown Christmas Festival and Wintertime Holiday Festivals are still ongoing. Uh, the Charlotte Christmas Festival ends on the 19th of uh, this month and uh, Wintertime finishes on the 9th of January. We're getting huge uh, positive comments on the projection. Uh, a lot of people talking about the production. Um, I believe CBC is going to do a broadcast uh, from the rooftop of its projection on this coming Friday night. I think. Uh, that I um, heard, and the uh, Victorian Christmas market, although the first day kicked off with the terrible rain, was a huge success. In fact, some of the vendors had a had um, record-breaking night, uh, despite the uh, the weather. The uh, the new score website is now live after uh, a lot of work and uh, an extended period of time. Obviously, COVID impacted that. Just a reminder that website, although the city owns it, is housed on the Discover Charlottetown platform. Uh, because in most destinations, the destination marketing organization uh, also uh, is responsible for the sport tourism file. So in order to leverage our site visits, uh, we did a partnership on that particular um, project. Um, Ice City work continues uh, on Ice City. It will be the month of February and into March. Funding applications have been submitted. We're just waiting for final approvals and trying to determine where the pandemic takes us the next uh, little bit. Our team uh, has been working um, with uh, other staff, uh, lead staff on strategy slash official plan. So we've submitted all of our information for our area, economic development, tourism, event management, um, and culture. Uh, so we're waiting for instructions on the next step of that process. We also submitted our annual report information for the mayor and council annual report, uh, which Doug and communication staff is uh, spearheading. Infrastructure uh, projects at East Link Center is taking up a lot of my time, especially on the, uh, the budget side. And we're also about to launch a strategy, a strap plan for East Link Center for the next five years to help them uh, through the recovery period of the uh, pandemic. Recently, when I was in Ottawa, also met as the Canadian, uh, with the Canadian Garden Council, of which I'm a national board member on uh, garden tourism. 2022 will be the year of the garden. More information to come in that. And today we had a great announcement. Uh, the mayor uh, was involved with the Eastern Canadian uh, Basketball League, uh, selecting Charlottetown as a uh, as a city for um, the Charlottetown Power within the league. We're quite happy about that. It was an exciting uh, announcement. Six teams have now con been confirmed: two for New Brunswick, two for Fe two PEI, and two Nova Scotia. And then they have an expansion for next year and the year after. So we're pretty happy about that. And we have lots of. Uh, other great announcements to come between now and uh, early in the new year, so stay tuned. Question: Is that is that privately owned the basketball team, or how does that work? The I must have missed the last. The time. Eastern Canadian Basketball League owns all teams. Oh, they do. And they own all teams in the league. They pick the teams' colors. They pick the team names. They will do their own draft. They do everything, and there is no um, subsidization by the municipality. It's a straight up rental of the Eastlink Center. Mm -hmm. So there's no owners of the team top? The owners is the, the league. league. Yes, it's the league, league and the league owns all teams. Oh, yeah. it's different, isn't it? Yeah. Good. And it was a very good announcement, Madam Chair. Yes, I'm sorry I missed <laughs> it. Charlotte, Sometimes Charlotte people Power. have busy when's times. When's the Charlottetown yeah. Power game against the Summerside like Slam? Slam. When, when's that coming up? In, in March. March. Yeah. You should do the so tip-off. So when does the league start, Wayne? So. Sorry. The league starts in, sometime in March okay. uh, 2022, and it will run into June. So basically, it's sort of the schedule that they had with the old storm. Well, it'd be in a way. Diff yeah, differently, but it'd be somewhat similar, I would think. They haven't announced their schedule yet. Tickets will go on sale soon at the East Link Center uh, box office. Okay. And Mayor Brown, just for the record, did suggest today that he will be slamming Mayor Basil Stewart in the opening night at the We're gonna slam. Yeah. We're gonna slam the Summerside Slam. Well, that would be worth the price of admission. <laughs> but spot when. <laughs> yeah. That'd be worth the price of admission to go see those two. <laughs> no, all of council will have to be there with the power hats, and I get one in the office. No doubt in my mind. <laughs> no doubt in my mind. Right. Right. You, you, you weren't there. No, I know. I'm probably going to Jersey too, Jace. Madam Chair, just two quick um, 
report items and they're both information <laughs> sharing. Yes, because uh, we read yeah. Yeah. We already touched. Um, as always, the mayor referenced one earlier, yeah. um, the Government of Canada Economic Benefits of Immigration to Canada. It's a nice little chart. I encourage you to take the opportunity to read it. Mm -hmm. Some interesting facts. And the second item is uh, meet, meetings conventions PEI held its uh, annual meeting for 2020-2021 and I'm just circulating the uh, yeah, report to the uh, committee for your information. And, well, thank you. Madam Chair, it, on this report for the immigration, is where is the report itself? It's online, is it? Uh, your worship, it would be. This is just a, a I guess. Summary. This These is just a great document. Yeah. Like, this well, is just a document that was shared during the platform session that we agenda? participated in. Yeah, I'll get you one. Yeah. Oh, you got one. Growing Canadian, uh, growing 1,100 Canadian companies, created 60,000 new jobs for Canadians. Yeah. Unbelievable. I know. It's great. Keep the collaboration going because they're a big part of our moving forward for sure. That's all that I have. Thank you. So I'm going to ask now for a motion to move into closed Council. session as per section 1191E of the MGA. Matter still under investigation. Good sure. and good. Um, I think we will just sign off from that point. So the live feed will end now. And